I guess without further ado, are you ready? I am. I'm here. I'm going to do the uh, screen sharing <laughs> thing uh, because right. that's what you're supposed to do. And I have slides because that's what you're supposed to do as well. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. Hello. Uh, I can see uh, I can see names and faces of people that I know really, really well, people from my very distant past and people from quite uh, recently. Um, and uh, so hello, it's lovely to see you all. Um, just to say, so my talk today is called uh, uh, Every Day is a School Day, uh, because recently I've been on a, uh, an extremely steep learning, learning curve. Um, and I would say that there are probably people in this room, uh, Arthur included, that I just said hello to just now, who have a great deal more experience than I do uh, in this subject. Um, recently, uh, we started running uh, free online lessons for refugees, um, simply because uh, I became aware of the fact that there are a lot of them around um, in the UK and they have uh, very little access to any kind of uh, English language lessons. So uh, Lizzie uh, heard about the lessons, got in touch with me and asked me if I would do a talk. So uh, this is what I've put together. I have to say almost everything in the session is about what I've learned. Uh, there are, there's not a lot of facts or a lot of stuff that I really, really, uh, this is the first time I've ever done a talk about stuff that I don't know a huge lot about. So please uh, be kind to me. Please correct me in the chat box when I say stuff that's wrong. Um, and uh, please uh, uh, join in as much as you like in the chat box. I'm not fantastic at multitasking and reading and reading and talking at the same time. But uh, it'll be it would be really nice to have everybody uh, share their views as we go along. So I'm just showing you the the, the topics that I'm going to be covering uh, in my talk. Um, and so I'll give you a second to digest and then uh, I'll move to the next slide. So first, some facts about uh, the situation in Ukraine. So um, these are some statistics that have been uh, produced by the United Nations. And this is from an article uh, on the BBC uh, that I, I read when I was preparing this session. Um, again, I'll give you uh, some seconds, some minutes to look at this and to digest these numbers. Um, So my talk really uh, is, about, is about these 12 million people. Um, and, but I think a lot of the things that I've learned about teaching refugees, Ukrainian refugees, which are, which are essentially the people that come to our lessons, I think those things uh, cross-pollinate and can be applied to teaching refugees uh, of, from other nations. We have we have a huge number of Afghan refugees in the UK and a, a huge number of Syrian and other refugees um, uh, also who I think a similar kind of program to the program that we're working on could be used to help them to improve their English. So we're talking here about 12 million people uh, that, have, that are not in their homes. Uh, they're either in a neighboring country and I think we're, we're thinking that UK could be a neighboring country. Um, I understand there are also uh, refugees, Ukrainian refugees arriving in the United States and Canada uh, in quite large numbers. Um, in fact, we have a CELTA candidate recent, recently on a course in Missouri, who, who is a Ukrainian refugee that has relocated to Toronto. Um, so we're really talking about these 12 million people. Um, uh, I also should say that this talk is very much going to be kind of anecdotal, and I apologize if it's, uh, if it's not sufficiently factual, but I hope I can leave you with some places to go and look at the end. Um, so here's a question for you, um, and I'd like you to answer it in the, in the chat box if you can. How many refugees do you think there are, Ukrainian refugees? So we talked about the 12 million. We talked about how many are, are in the Ukraine displaced and how many are in uh, neighboring countries. 
How many do you think are in the UK? I'll give you a minute to write a number. This is a guess, right? Okay, so you see, you, you guys are much more advanced than me because I thought like a month ago, I thought they were like 2000 or, or 150. My neighbor opposite, when I asked her, she said it was 150. So I thought they were like one or two or 20,000 or, or something like that. Um, but I have learned that there are 90, uh, sorry, these, these figures go back to last week because they're published on a weekly basis. So these are figures that are published by the Home Office um, and the home, this is the UK government Home Office. And as of, uh, as of the 5th of July, there were uh, 175,000 visa applications received, 148, probably by now 150,000 uh, visas issued and 91,000. So like now we are saying 95. So somebody wrote 100,000 in the, um, Rachel, hi Rachel, wrote 100,000 in the chat box. And that's probably, that's probably about where we are now. So, so what we have is we have 100,000 100, uh, Ukrainian refugees who have found themselves in the UK. And uh, so these are the students that we have targeted for our classes. Um, and so uh, a little bit about, about who they are. So who are these people that have, have come to our classes? Um, and again, I'll give you a, a minute to, to look at the things I've written here um, and a minute to digest. I'm, I'm as you know, loath to read out loud. Um, but I'll pick out one or two points. First, I'll keep quiet and let you read. So th this, uh, this situation kind of came to my attention because I live in a village about five miles outside Cambridge called Combaton. And I take my dog for a walk every day in the park. And more and more increasingly, I was meeting people who are uh, young women uh, and older women and children all of whom were Ukrainian uh, and all of whom, the weather is really lovely in the UK. And so we've been having, uh, you know, the park is the obvious place to go. So my friend down the road uh, has hosted a Ukrainian, uh, uh, a Ukrainian uh, lady, her sister and, and her child. And so I've met these people. I meet them all the time in the park and they speak no English. So what we have is we have huge numbers of Ukrainian women living in the UK, in people's houses, because they have a room in the house, they have shared facilities. They have a little bit of money that they're given at the beginning. They are claiming benefits, but they don't speak English. So in a way, they're kind of trapped in people's houses. The people are very welcoming. The people are very kind. The ones I know, I'm sure they're ones that, that aren't. And there is, I understand, an issue with people who arrive and don't like where they've ended up. And, and I think that's something to, that we're going to need to follow up. Uh, the government certainly will need to do something about what happens to people who end up in a place that's not good. Um, but anyway, so they, here they are, no English lessons, nobody really uh, to teach them English and low level learners. Uh, but we also have in our lessons some men. 
So we have some peop some men that have heard about the classes who are still in Ukraine. So we have, which actually brings some joy to our students because it means that they can get real news in real time from people who are in, in, in cities that they are from. Um, so we have women, we have men, we have people from all walks of life. We have people highly qualified. We have economists, we have uh, politicians, we have doctors and lawyers. And we also have people that do uh, teachers. We have people who do uh, uh, mechanics and you know, ordinary cleaners, nurses, all, all professions. Um, and we have uh, some men. And many of the students that we have have trauma. I am not going to talk a lot about trauma because I'm already talking about things that I'm not well qualified to talk about. And talking about trauma would be even more, un I'm even more unqualified to talk about trauma. So I've taken, I've taken a definition of what is trauma uh, from our future learn course called Volunteering with the Refugees, which I'll tell you a bit more about later on. Um, uh, and again, I'll, I'll be quiet and give you uh, a second just to read um, what I've written about, uh, about trauma. Okay, uh, and a little more information about uh, how a person that is dealing with trauma might present themselves in a lesson. Again, I've taken this, uh, I've copied this directly from the Future Learn course, um, Volunteering Refugees, and this information was provided by um, uh, one of the presenters on the course who works with refugees uh, in an organization called the Human Hive. Um, so the reason I'm, I'm talking about this is because this is, this is one of the things that makes our students a little different to your ordinary, uh, your ordinary student that's paid their money or not paid their money and pitched up to class and don't have a hundred other things going on in their lives and in their head. And, and is one of the things that we need to be mindful about as teachers in our lessons. And so uh, the, the, the next, uh, the next uh, topic really that I, I have in, the, in my uh, list of things to cover is what are the needs uh, because as teachers, one of the, the, the absolute first thing that we do is we have to consider what are the needs of our students in the class. And perhaps those of you, uh, I don't think you need experience of, of teaching refugees to, to imagine what these people's needs are. So we're talking really predominantly about the refugees that have come to the UK, but we also have refugees who are actually in other parts of the world. We have some that are in Poland. We have a couple that I have one that is in Switzerland some that are in other European countries, and we have the ones that are, are still currently in the Ukraine. So perhaps you could use the chat box just for a minute or two, just to say what you think might be their needs. I don't mean in life, okay? I mean their needs in terms, terms of, 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 of uh, everyday things. What do they need to do right now in England? Uh, and I'll give you a minute to write something in the chat box. Okay. Oh, Nick. 
thank you, Nick. I, you sent me a direct message. It's a, absolutely, they need survival English. Um, they they may they need a lot of help. Thank you, James. They need a lot of help with the league with documentation, all kinds of legal stuff, because they get here and and then they need they need help with with what to do next. Communication skills, lovely. Thank you. Lots of lots of ideas coming in. Um, so I've I've made a few notes uh, of what they what they need. Um, the first thing that they need is a job, uh, because they arrive and they're given a very small amount of money. They're given two, 200 and something pounds, I believe, when they arrive. And then the first port of call in order to kick, in order for them to be able to, to get more money, uh, money to survive on, is they have to go to the job center and they have to sign up for employment. Regardless of the fact that they speak no English, they still have to go to the job center and they still have to go through an interview at the job center where incidentally there are no translators. Uh, so they have this kind of weird interview on Google, Google on their phones with Google Translate and they get sent for, for job interviews almost immediately. So in order to get benefits, they need to sign up uh, with the job center to say that they're going to seek work and the job center then send them to look for work. But they are happy to do that because actually they, they want to be able to settle and they want to be able to provide some kind of, uh, they need to feed their children and they need to provide for their families. In addition, they also need to think about looking for somewhere to live long-term. So they're gonna need money for that as well. Because what happens with the sponsorship pro program is that uh, they are they are in the, the it's provided for a minimum of six months. So that means they have a room in that person's house for six months, and it is then up to negotiation whether they they continue for a further six months. But after twelve months, the sponsors stop getting money. So the the additional money that the families are getting to help with electricity and water and all the bills that money dries up after 12 months. And so uh, it's, it's really uh, a matter of concern, but also, you know, they're there, they're, you're here with your family, with your children, with your sister, with your auntie. Um, you haven't got your husband or your boyfriend or your brother or your uncle or any of your men, but you're, you're here and you are hoping that either you can go back home eventually or that your family perhaps can come. So you need a home and you need to settle. In order to do all of these things, you need to be able to speak English. So, so why not then just go to a face-to-face -face class, you know, in town? So uh, I live in, as I said, in a village outside Cambridge, uh, and it and Cambridge is a big city. And so why can't these people that I meet in the park go into Cambridge for English lessons? They can't do it round here because we don't have a we don't have any round here. Well, there aren't any. There are very few classes for any refugees, and there are very few classes for newly arriving refugees because the classes that are there are full. So, uh, so that the face-to-face -face possibility right now is very, very limited. What, what classes there are, I don't know in other parts of the country, I expect London perhaps is a bit more geared up. If there are people in this room that know what the situation is regarding uh, lessons around the country for, for refugees, then please put it in the chat box. Um, but I know that it is very limited where I live. But even if they were available, there is an issue with going into Cambridge for lessons. Number one is that you have to have the money to get the bus. Number two, you have to have, it takes an, it takes an hour, maybe 40 minutes to get into Cambridge and get back. So that's, if the lesson is an hour, that's three hours. Who is going to look after your child? Remember, these are women. There are very many of them that have children. 
And so the issue of childminding and attending in English lessons is a pretty stark one. How do they attend? How do they go to a lesson? What do they do with their children? Also, we are talking here about uh, people that may be dealing with trauma. One of the, one of the manifestations of trauma is a, is a severe lack of confidence. Um, and if you speak no English, getting the confidence to get on a bus, go into town, find the place that the English lesson is, go into a room full of total strangers and attend English lessons, is all really rather daunting. So my friend Lucy and I decided that we would see if we could set up online lessons, which would alleviate the issue of having to spend money to go in the bus, having to travel into Cambridge, and having to have lessons maybe only once a week. So, so what we did instead was provide online lessons. And so what we've done is we have one 45 minute lesson every day. At six o'clock every afternoon, we provide one 45 minute lesson for beginners. So we say the classes are for beginners because higher level students have the possibility of going to classes online with CELTA courses as TP students. There is a great demand for TP students, teaching practice students in CELTA teaching practice classes. So higher level learners have that possibility already, but those classes do not accept beginners. So we have gone for the beginner option. So every day we have one 40 minute lesson uh, on Zoom. Our lessons are taught by well-qualified, experienced teachers and teacher trainers who volunteer one evening a week to teach on a regular basis. And I have to say that I have been I have been blessed because the teachers that have volunteered, uh, we currently have four groups of students operate. So we started this uh, four weeks ago. We currently have four groups of students with a total of 170 students signed up. The 170 students are divided into the four groups according to when they, when they registered for the course. And for each of those groups, we have five teachers. So I have a total of 20 teachers, teacher trainers working on this project with me. And as I said, I have been just blessed because I have some of the most experienced teachers uh, that you can ever find uh, who have all, who all give up their time uh, for one hour a week. There are a couple of people that are doing two evenings a week. Um, and and we we found that the group that started first of all four weeks ago are really coming along extremely well. Uh, we've discovered that some of the ones that seem to be beginners are actually because they're kind of becoming more relaxed in the lessons. We're finding out that they know a lot more English than they thought they have. So the classes are kind of mixed ability. Uh, but we're trying to keep the groups together uh, from, from, from the day that they started. So the, the group one began on the 13th of June, and they've kind of more or less stayed together. And then group four started uh, two weeks ago. Um, and, and so what it means is that the students can attend class. They can look after their children because they could, the children can be in the same room. We don't mind. We don't require silence. Um, and, and they can attend when they want. If they want to come every day, they can come every day. If they want to come once a week, they can come once a week. It's up to them. What we're finding uh, is that we have uh, mixed ability. We're finding we have people attending at different times. Some come 
for a little bit and then and then leave the lesson. Sometimes they arrive late. Sometimes they they come and go. Um, we're also learning about the students themselves. I think I think something that Monica Paul told me a, a while back of she has a lot of experience of dealing with refugees um, is that these students do not choose to be students. Okay, they've they've this has happened to them. So it's not a situation, they're not lifelong learners and they're not natural students. You know, they're economists and they're they are nurses and they don't, they they have no desire really to be learners. They need to learn English because of the situation that they found themselves in. So they don't know anything about communicative teaching approaches and they don't know anything about pair work and, and they want everything translated. So we need the part of the teaching of the lessons involves teaching them methodology and teaching them uh, and, and, and trying to show them how, you know, going into breakout rooms, for example, is a good thing. Um, we also need to teach them about Zoom because it's not a, it's not a normal thing. They don't know how to use Zoom. Uh, even the ones that used Zoom in their work before uh, haven't used Zoom for lessons. So, so that's also a part of the things that we have to, that we have to learn. So, um, uh, I'll pause for a second just to give you a minute to digest or take a picture of whatever of the of the screen that I've I've noted. I think I've blabbed on about most of the stuff that's there. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just going to read something in the. So somebody's talking about free lessons in uh, in with refugees and asylum seekers in Glasgow, and actually we have a we have a contingent from Dundee in our in our uh, refugee classes because one of our teachers uh, is a is a lecturer at Dundee College and has managed to scoop up a whole bunch of refugees who are based in Dundee. So um, we don't we don't mind where they are, to be honest. Um, okay, so what do we do in our lessons? How does it work? So. Uh, what we do is every day, uh, every week rather, I choose a topic. Um, I choose a topic and I put the topic on a, on a Google Doc and I put a little bit more meat uh, to the topic. So this is an example of, uh, of what we did, I believe, in week three. I think week one, we did talking about yourself. Week two, we did jobs because of this thing of them having to go to the job center and, and, and be interviewed almost immediately. I think this is week three, uh, where we the subject was about food because they have to go to the shop and buy food, um, and they have to go to the supermarket, and they have to they're in the house with English people, cooking in the kitchen perhaps with the families around, and so so week three uh, was about food, um, and so this is what this is because I have such fantastic teachers I give no direction, uh, I just I put this and I let them make. Uh, whatever sense of my nonsense they can make. And, and they make fantastic sense. So what we do is I put this uh, at the beginning of the week. And then when the teachers have taught their lesson on the Google Doc, they write a short summary of what they did in the lesson. And there's also a comment box on there that they can say anything about students, about the students that came into their class. So that's like a kind of handover for the lesson the, for the teacher the next day. Um, and so far, I think we've managed to avoid duplication um, and, and the, so certainly the feedback from the students has been very positive. Um, so I also said I'd talk a bit about, about topics to select, topics to avoid and topics to be careful about. As I said right at the beginning, I am talking here from a point of ignorance. So I've kind of taken these what I've learned about this, I've taken from the Future Learn course, and I've taken from voices on that course that were experienced and, uh, and, and made suggestions about things to talk about and things not to talk about. And I think the thing that I've taken away, the kind of main message that I've taken away is that we, when we instigate topics, we should try and avoid topics that might trigger trauma. 
if the students want to talk about things that from their past or from where they come from, or they want to talk about things that have happened to them on their journey, then that's fine because they have introduced the topic and they want to talk about it. However, as a starting point, uh, Darren on, on the Future Learn course uses the expression where they are at to talk about things where they are at. So talk about topics that are current, that are relevant to them now. So if you want to talk about past tenses, don't talk about what they did last year. Talk about what they did yesterday. So talk about their current situation. You can still do past tenses. You can still do future tenses, but talk about what they're doing tomorrow, not what they're hoping to do next month or next year, because actually what they want to do is go home. And, and, and the concept of that is upsetting, um, I would imagine. Again, as I said, I don't know because I've not been there. Um, so these are topics that I've decided uh, that I will be avoiding in my, in my Google Doc. Um, and I can see Arthur looking at me. So I'm thinking maybe if you have, Arthur, if you have anything to share, please, your experience in this is so much faster than mine. Uh, so uh, if there are topics that you would like to add to the chat box or anything that you'd like to mention, uh, please do so. Um, great. So uh, I also have uh, in, my, in my next slide some tips that I've taken uh, from, again, this is from the FutureLearn course, from people uh, who have who have an experience of dealing with uh, with refugee classes, um, and I'm my teachers. I think do this. I think these are things that we would normally do anyway. Actually, uh, in our EFL classrooms. Um, uh, so I'll give you a second to 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 take a picture or just to look at it um, if you would like to do that. Lastly, um, this, is a, this is a slide from a, a webinar, which I, if you have an interest in this subject, uh, I commend to you. Uh, this is a, a, a webinar called Coping with Trauma in the Classroom. Um, it's, uh, it's on the CUP website. Put the link there if you'd like to write it down or take a picture or whatever. Um, and it's by Dr. Kate Briarton. I come from Guyana, it's not a I and E, we don't do well. So I don't know if I pronounced it. I hope I haven't correct, pronounced it too badly. Um, but these are some of her do's and don'ts for uh, dealing with a trauma sensitive classroom. Um, and again, I think, you know, if you think about it, they're kind of common sense. Um, and some of the things I've talked about already, um, but perhaps, you know, they need kind of spelling out. Uh, and this is my last slide, uh, which is kind of, if you'd like to follow up in any way uh, with, this, with, with this talk, um, these are some things that I've discovered. Um, I commend to you uh, the Future Learn course called Volunteering with Refugees. I know that a lot of people in this room right now have done this course. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. Uh, please take a picture. I'm gonna stop showing my slides uh, uh, very, very soon. But the Future Learn course is there. It's running. Uh, it's three weeks. It's free. Um, you will meet a lot of like-minded people on there, um, and uh, it's uh, really interesting. Uh, the, the, the next thing is a YouTube talk that I came across um, by uh, uh, somebody called Victoria Wilson. Um, the, the, the second to last option there, um, which is something called we're all in this together or we're all on this. I think it's in this together. I'm sorry, I made a typo. Um, this is uh, two uh, Ukrainian teachers. Uh, teacher trainers, actually, one of whom is still in Kiev and one of whom uh, is in one of those neighboring countries sharing their experience of, 
of being a refugee uh, and of being uh, of of teach of dealing with matters. Uh, I would say that uh, Irena is perhaps not a refugee because she's still in in Kiev, but uh, uh, it's a it's a it's heart wrenching to be honest. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now. So uh, that's it, guys. That's uh, that's sort of what I prepared. I'm sorry it's been death by PowerPoint. Um, uh, I don't uh, I don't advocate it, but there you go. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, I'm uh, I think perhaps I have one minute, but not many more, um, and I'm happy to, okay. to answer them. Although, <laughs> all right, thank you very much. That was fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, there is one question I see here. Someone was asking, where are your free students coming from? I mean, like within the area that they're there. <laughs> oh, I see. OK, so we have, as I said, we have students who are still in Ukraine. Yep. So we have some men that are there. We have the, uh, we have, uh, the biggest number are from Cambridge and surrounding areas because okay. once word got out, once we set up the classes here, and my friend who has uh, two, uh, who has Ina and Alona as her guests, um, they started to spread the word around in their area and they put an ad up uh, and they, they uh, went to, there's a, um, there's a, they meet every Sunday in a church hall in Cambridge and the word just spread like wildfire and I had 64 inquiries in one day. Um, and wow. so, but we also have this contingent that are in, that is in Dun, from Dundee College. Mm -hmm. I have some pre people from Saffron Walden which is a, a city near Cambridge. Um, and I also have some people that are coming from, from uh, an area near Brighton where one of our other teachers come from. So really it's just, we have people, we have some people in Poland, we have some people, as I said, from Scotland, we have people from everywhere and we are not turning anyone away, not one single person. If people come, uh, if people come and they are, they're too high, the level is too high, I might suggest that they, that they try TP classes. I give them a list of centers that I know that are looking for TP students. And I send them to the TP students Facebook page. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of them still keep coming to our lessons because they feel safe and they have a community and they are very helpful and supportive actually. They're an asset to the, to the, to the lower level learners. Some people asking how large are our Zoom classes? Uh, the maximum number that we've had so far in one class is 20. I will mm -hmm. not go beyond that because mm -hmm. I don't feel that just because you're a refugee, you should have to have 45 people in your class. I will keep opening more groups as I need. As, as the groups grow, I will grow, I will grow too. Um, so if any of you want to, want to volunteer as a refugee, uh, as, a, as a teacher of refugees, please let me know. The classes are at six o'clock every afternoon. Um, right now, I don't need anybody right now, but I'd be very happy to. Uh, I'd be very happy to have um, to meet anyone um, and to keep you on my books for that day that I get sixty-four people and suddenly I have to open three groups. I'm going to. I'm going to try and do this dumb thing of two things of typing and talking at the same time, uh, because I'm going to put my uh, my email address in the. Uh, in the chat box right now. So if anybody feels that they'd like to volunteer one 40 minute lesson, uh, you must obviously be a qualified English language teacher uh, because as, again, just because you're a refugee, I don't think you should have to be taught by people who are not qualified teachers. Um, so uh, you need to be a qualified teacher uh, and you need to have experience of teaching online because uh, that also is, a, is, it's very important that the teacher knows what they're doing uh, in order to be able to help the students. Great, thank you very much for sharing that. So again, her, her email address is in the, uh, in the chat box there. Um, I will throw up um, our email address as well. So that's um, for Teaching House, the organization putting this together today. So if for some reason you can't get a hold of Marie, you can always contact us as well. And then we Thanks, can James. redirect you that way as well. So but that's a fantastic service. Really, really great service you guys put together.